Good afternoon. I'm Erica Stone Street, president of our Phi Beta Kappa chapter here at St. Ben's and St. John's. Please be seated. I'd like to begin tonight's ceremony by inviting President Michael Hemeseth to the podium to deliver uh, some brief welcome remarks. Good afternoon. Welcome to those of you who only traveled as far as Collegeville and St. Joseph, but a special welcome to those of you that traveled a little bit farther to come and see your sons and daughters honor this afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're here to honor a special group of students, uh, but we're also here to honor the mission of what these institutions are all about. Um, we, we are first and foremost academic institutions and the students uh, in front of us today are the students that have taken that responsibility, that, that task as seriously as any students on our campus. And so we wanna acknowledge the hard work, the discipline, the time, the energy, uh, that these students have put into their academic endeavors and, and want to honor them for that, for those efforts. Uh, I want to just say a couple quick comments about um, an experience I had uh, in terms of honoring academic prowess. When I got to graduate school, I had an interesting lesson in that um, process. When you go to graduate school, of course, you're surrounded by people that take academic work very seriously. And, you know, the folks that choose to go on, and, and particularly those who go on to get PhDs, take academics very seriously, they're gonna make that their career in most cases. And so when I went on to graduate school, I was not at all surprised to find myself surrounded by lots of very smart and talented people. But what I was a little bit struck by in my first year or so in graduate school, I didn't, lived in graduate dormitories where we were, uh, students from all different disciplines were living in those dormitories. And it was interesting in the evenings as we gathered uh, in the lounge to talk or to watch TV, um, it became clear to me that there was a kind of intellectual one-upsmanship that was going on uh, among the students in this setting. And, you know, that was not maybe a big surprise. These were people that took academics very seriously, and their, their self-identity, my own included, uh, was importantly determined by you know, our academic success. And to be surrounded by a bunch of other smart, talented people, there seemed to be this desire to and kind of try to show that you were deserving of being there, that somehow whatever insecurities you had uh, needed to be masked by the fact that you were uh, cleverer or smarter or uh, more informed than the others in the room. And it often took uh, place at the expense of others where you would make jokes or you would um, sometimes be a little bit unduly harsh if someone was wrong about something or had a, made a factual error. And I remember thinking at the time, and this feels different to me than my experience at St. Ben's and St. John's, and it wasn't that I didn't have you know, lots of very talented, smart friends at St. Ben's and St. John's, and the faculty that I met were, were as talented and as smart as the faculty that I met when I was in graduate school, but there was something a little different about the character of the individuals that I met at St. Ben's and St. John's that I had kind of taken for granted when I was a student here. I just assumed that you know, you didn't have to, it, maybe it was a Midwestern thing, but I, was, I also think it was a Catholic and Benedictine thing, that you weren't supposed to show off. You weren't supposed to um, brag about your academic prowess. You weren't supposed to show other people how smart and clever you were. Uh, and I came to realize as I thought about my group of friends at St. Ben's and St. John's, what they had in common wasn't that they were all bright or, or were well-educated or, or great students, but it was that they were good people, that they were kind and thoughtful and considerate. And, you know, I don't want to be unfair to my friends from graduate school. They, you know, they were good people in the end, but I think in this setting where we were all um, in this kind of first year kind of hothouse of graduate school where we were all, at least many of us, were trying to make sure that we established that we actually belonged in graduate school, that maybe the best side of ourselves wasn't shown. But I would just encourage you and remind you that for as talented academically as you are and, and what a great job you've done at St. Ben's and St. John's and you will undoubtedly go on and do great things uh, academically once you graduate from these places, that uh, it's important to remember the other piece of, of success in life. In addition to being, you know, academically talented, that can be very important and can serve you very well in life. It's also important to think about character issues. And so uh, let me leave you with a quote that I, that I quite like, and let me give it a little bit of a twist for you all. So Abraham Joshua Herschel is a, a famous rabbinical scholar who passed away in the early 70s. And he said, uh, during the end, toward the end of his life, he said, when I was young, I admired clever people. 
Now that I am old, I admire kind people. Um, I'm not quite prepared to accept the old mantle, maybe the middle-aged mantle, but let me say to you as, as young people, uh, it's never too early to start admiring kind people, and certainly as you go into the world, uh, take your Benedictine and Catholic and St. John's and St. Ben's values with you, and you can be both clever and kind as you make your way through the world, as I'm quite confident that you will. So congratulations on your academic successes, and we look forward to following your successes in the years and decades ahead. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow members of Phi Beta Kappa, honored guests. We meet here today to receive into our society those who, having f qualified for election, now wish to be admitted to its privileges and undertake its responsibilities. In a ceremony that goes back to the time of the founding of our nation, we shall welcome them into an association with all those who have been members of Phi Beta Kappa in the past and into lifelong relationship with the society today. The candidates for membership in course will please rise. According to Phi Beta Kappa documents dating from 1779, the president of Alpha Chapter greeted initiates as follows. This society was founded by a few friends. At first, it was confined to a small number of very worthy students. They planted the scion, from which has grown this tree that now buds forth before your eyes with blossoms of harmony and concord. It was ingrafted on the stock of friendship in the soil of virtue enriched by literature. To cherish and keep it alive hath been the constant care of those members who have succeeded. You are about to become one of those successors and it is our fondest hope that you in turn will come to cherish the society and will strive to perpetuate the spirit of this greeting. You may be seated. As is customary on this occasion, the historian Sheila Hellerman will give you a brief account of the history of the society. On December 5th, 1776, a group of young men who were then studying at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia, met to create a secret society, at once intellectual and social in purpose. The president's greeting to new members in 1779 reads in part, here, you are to indulge in matters of speculation, that freedom of inquiry that ever dispels the clouds of falsehood by the radiant sunshine of truth. In their clandestine meetings, the members seriously debated a host of questions, such as whether a wise state hath any interest nearer at heart than the education of the youth, the establishment soon after of chapters at Yale and Harvard ensured that Phi Beta Kappa would survive the arrival of General Cornwallis's troops at Williamsburg. A little over a century later, more than 25 branches of the society were in existence, and it was felt that a national structure was needed to bring together the scattered chapters into some uniformity. In 1883, the organization known today as the United Chapters of Phi Beta Kappa was founded. It has its headquarters today in Washington, D.C. In 1875, Phi Beta Kappa enlarged its membership to include women. The society now has over 500,000 living members, elected over the years by 270 chapters at colleges and universities throughout the country. In addition, more than 50 local alumni associations lend the society their support and provide members an opportunity for a lifelong relationship with Phi Beta Kappa and their activities and goals on the community level. As you can see, Phi Beta Kappa continues to take great pride in its origins. It retains a number of the symbols that were devised for it at the time when the American Republic was still coming into being. The present Phi Beta Kappa key, for example, virtually reproduces the design originated by the founders of the Society at William and Mary. On the front, 
It bears the Greek letters, Phi Beta Kappa, the initials of the Greek words meaning, love of learning is the guide of life. The three stars in the upper left-hand corner symbolize the aims of the society, friendship, morality, and literature. A pointing hand in the lower right-hand corner stands for aspiration. And on the reverse side are inscribed the letters S and P, which stand for the society's second motto, the Latin words meaning philosophical society. Below them appears the date of the founding first chapter, December 5, 1776, and the member's name and electing chapter are engraved above. Phi Beta Kappa ceases to be a secret society over 150 ceased to be a secret society over 150 years ago. The society's symbols and purposes are now well known across the land. These purposes were eloquently summarized in the following statement by one of the society's most eminent members, Charles Evans Hughes, the late Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. The particular interest of Phi Beta Kappa is in liberal education, intensive study of educational aims and methods has found nothing to take its place. It means the development by careful training of a capacity to appreciate what has been done and thought and the ability to make worthwhile appraisals of achievements, doctrines, theories, and proposals. It is liberal because it emancipates. It signifies freedom from the tyranny of ignorance and from what is worse, the dominion of folly. Phi Beta Kappa holds aloft the old banner of scholarship. And to the students, who have turned aside from the easier paths and by their talent and fidelity have proved themselves to be worthy. It gives fitting recognition of a special distinction. Will the candidates for membership and course please rise? In accordance with the rules of this chapter and in consequence of our good opinion of your intellectual and moral character, supported by your record of high attainment at this institution, you have been selected as worthy of becoming members of Phi Beta Kappa. Your names have been submitted to the scrutiny of the constitutional electors of this chapter and have met with their approval. You've been formally notified of your election by your, and by your presence here signify your desire to be enrolled as members of this ancient and honorable society. Therefore, I now inquire, do you solemnly promise that you will be true and faithful to Phi Beta Kappa, uphold its standards, obey its laws, and seek to reflect credit upon your affiliation with this venerable fellowship of learners? If so, say we do. Thank you. <laughs> Each of you has now affirmed your loyalty to Phi Beta Kappa and pledged to uphold its standards. We welcome you into the ranks of membership and ask that you now come forward as the secretary calls your name, receive the chapter's greeting, and sign the chapter register. Please be seated. Now comes my favorite part. As a formerly secret society, Phi Beta Kappa also had a secret handshake. All right, so the easiest way to think of how to do this is to make the live long and prosper sign from Star, War, Star, Star Trek. And then you're going to fold your bottom two fingers down and interlock your front two fingers in, the, in their neighbor's fingers. You can practice this. Take a minute. I'll help you. <laughs> All right, there you go, they got it. Okay, so as you come up on stage, you can shake my hand with a secret handshake or you can just do the regular way, that's okay too. <laughs> All right, with the first row of initiates, please approach the stage as the secretary Clark Cotton takes the podium to call your names.
R.J. Alpers. Jeffrey Anderson. <laughs> Margaret Anderson. Anna Baumgartner. Victoria Beach. Stephanie Best. Peter Best. Stephanie Bierman. Brandy Bolig. Anna Marie Brenhofer. Claire Bicey. Joseph Bizey, Emma Christensen, Grant Christian. Katrina Christian. Sarah Clark. Jake Collins. Michael Collins. Laura Comey. Anna Crone. Annie DeSutter. Emily Doyle. Scott Ecternot.
Allison Fischbach, Rebecca Flynn, Jessica Freudenberg. Kyle Gog, Benjamin Gooley, Michelle Hansman, William Heron. Adam Hay. Hannah Houts. Sydney Hughes, Rebecca Humbert, Alex Inglesrud, Nathaniel Johnson, Chase Kenny, Paul Knock, Caitlin Knapp. Nicole Kuntz, Peyton Larson, Megan Lenz, Michael Mackin. Edward Malik, Mia McFicker, Luke Mori. Janae Myers, Alex Niederlow, Emily Olinger, Caitlin Peterson. Hannah Piaski, Hannah Salto, Emily Schoenbeck. Shannon Skelly, Eliana Stinesson, 
Alexandra Streifel. Tyler Thompson. Joseph Trenzelek. Sadie Volley. Marcus Vivering. Daniel Voce. Sarah Wachter. Shelby Wisen. Megan Weiss. Nicole Womack. Initiates will please rise again. <laughs> by election of the chapter and by your assent to its pledge and the placing of your signature on its book, the society's requirements for initiation are fully satisfied. I therefore, in the presence of these members of the society, declare you to be members of the Theta chapter of Phi Beta Kappa in the state of Minnesota authorize you to wear its key as a badge and to participate in its meetings. Congratulations, ladies and gentlemen. You are now lifetime members of the nation's oldest academic honor society. Be active in its programs and the community alumni associations, support its endeavors and lofty goals, and be a working advocate for the liberal arts in our society. It is now my pleasure to welcome you as members of the chapter. Please be seated again. Each year, the students who were elected last year as juniors select the keynote speaker for this year. Sean Kohlberg in the theology department was this year's favorite, so I now invite him to give his address titled, Knowledge Approaching Wisdom, the Gift of the Liberal Arts. Favorite's a strong word. Maybe default might be better. But, uh, good evening. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And before going any further, I want to just take a moment to thank Professor Stone Street Clark, the others gathered here, and my colleagues in the seats for their faithful work here in the Phi Beta Kappa chapter. And uh, for all the parents and visitors we have with us, thank you for coming a distance and spending this evening with us. And maybe most importantly, Congratulations and thank you to you, our newest uh, admitted members of Phi Beta Kappa. It's an honor to be here with you tonight. Do you know that? It really is. Over your time here at St. Ben's and St. John's, you have distinguished yourselves in the classroom as having attained a, a rare degree of academic excellence. So before we go any further, let me just say congratulations on your amazing achievements. 
That's no small feat. Our classrooms are filled with talented Bennies and Johnnies who consistently impress us, your faculty, and your colleagues uh, with your intellectual gifts and your, and your goals and vocations. For you to be recognized as especially successful from among them is not only an honor, but a tribute to your hard work, your sense of gifts, and the ways in which you've shared those gifts and talents with others. You've made our communities and our experiences in the classroom much richer. You're the kind of students we all hope for sometimes to run into in our classrooms, and I thank you for being those people. Our topic for reflection, for the next few minutes anyway, is knowledge approaching wisdom, the gift of the liberal arts. Like many of you here, I like knowledge. I enjoy having information at my fingertips, being able to draw useful connections and understand the mechanics of an idea, an argument, or an experiment. I like to anticipate the outcomes of situations using my knowledge of circumstances and the things I've learned through study. I find that the acquisition of knowledge makes my life more interesting, and it opens pathways for exploration and growth that would have otherwise been unimaginable. I suspect that's why in my time as an undergraduate at our loving sister college, St. Olaf College, I accumulated three majors in English, political science, and religion, sang in the choir, and participated in a panoply of student clubs and organizations. Like St. Ben's and St. John's, St. Olaf offered students a wide common curriculum, one rooted in the liberal arts, that required me to take courses in the humanities, social sciences, hard sciences, and the fine arts. While not every class was an immediate home run, I nevertheless sensed that most of my courses gave me a foothold in an area of human knowledge and experience from which I could make keener observations and judgments, from which I could participate more robustly in a larger conversation, conversations in my family, in my, with my friends, in communities, and even with people I didn't know. The knowledge that I gained and progressively mastered as an Oli equipped me to enter and participate in a wider, diverse, and more demanding world. As Sir Francis Bacon put it, now almost a thousand years ago, knowledge itself is power. I have no doubt that many of you have had similar experiences. Few of you are the same persons you were when you entered here three or four years ago when you took that first ride on the link or settled into your dorm room for the first time or battled your way through FYS. <laughs> Maybe the second semester of FYS. <laughs> Think of all the things you know gathered from the wide corners of human exploration and analysis which you can now deploy in your professional and personal aspirations. As you leave this place, graduating seniors, those things that you have gained and, and come to know are great accomplishments and tools in your toolbox for your further use. We sincerely hope they make you successful Johnnies and Bennies in the world. But what is a successful Johnny or Benny? And what does it really mean to be successful in the world? How has your liberal arts education at a Catholic and Benedictine set of schools formed you to engage the world, whether that's in your family and circle of friends or in our larger constructions of communities around the globe? Let's go back to this idea of knowledge approaching wisdom and, considering the di and consider the different working difference between those two terms. They're venerable and ancient ideas, both of them, knowledge and wisdom, promoted by the ancients, by the medievals, and modern women and men. In the Latin West, these terms were denominated by the words scientia, knowledge, here's your lesson for today, and sapientia, wisdom. Scientia, which comes from the Latin, I say this with some trepidation with Professor Richardson sitting in the front row, <laughs> scio, scire, to know, uh, connotes the ability to understand or grasp things as they are, to know what the Pythagorean theorem is and how it works, to know the myriad of causes informing the U.S. Civil War, to know how many beats per measure 4-4 time allows, 
to know even what the doctrine of transubstantiation is and that it's not the same thing as the transfiguration. Okay? Knowledge is an awareness or understanding of facts, skills, ideas gained through effort and experience. Yet knowledge itself is passive. It is a kind of data or information which the knower deploys toward particular goals or ends. For example, I could use the knowledge of the boiling point of water for a variety of ends. Uh, what, here, what, do I, what did I write down? I could make pasta for my family, which I usually overcook. I go past the 10 minutes. I could avoid burning myself in the shower. I could try to create wa efficient water heaters, right, that use less uh, energy to heat, to heat the water we use. Or I could scald those who disagree with me. Right? <laughs> Knowledge is passive, and it awaits disposition by the knower. Now let's turn to the idea of sapientia. Does anyone know the Latin technical term for human beings? It's not homo scientias. It's homo sapiens. Hmm? Wise persons. At the core of what it means to be human, I would argue, is to be wise. So what does wisdom mean, and what does it look like? Maybe it's easier to, for us to start with what it looks like. So for a moment, I'd like you to just take a moment, you can close your eyes if you want, and try to imagine a person in your life whom you regard as wise. Just bring that person before your, for your mind's eye for a moment and think about him or her. Why do you think of this person in this way? To some extent, wisdom is a deeper understanding and appreciation for the way in which knowledge can be fitted together in such a way that it serves others and promotes higher goods, goods which often transcend the immediate situation of the individual homo sapien. The wise woman or man brings knowledge and experience to bear on questions or challenges so that they and others can grow in their full flourishing and become the persons whom they are created to be. When Pope Francis visited uh, the United States this last October and addressed the U.S. Congress, he suggested that the congressional leaders call to mind four wisdom figures. Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King Jr., Dorothy Day, and Thomas Merton. Few people would dispute that these persons represent lives well lived, that they were filled with knowledge and yet transcended or went beyond that knowledge or information or understanding of facts. In the persons you called to mind and in yourselves and in Abraham Lincoln, MLK, Dorothy Day, and Thomas Merton, we encounter women and men who were able to pursue and achieve greater overarching goods, which I would argue advanced some dimension of communion or community. Communion with friends and family, communion among divided persons, especially those at the margins of our communities, and communion even between God and others. Wisdom harnesses and directs knowledge in service to others, building up deep and concrete experiences of communion. Now that shouldn't be a surprise to any of our students in the room. We live and work in Benedictine communities, places rooted and shaped by our Benedictine friends in the monastery and enacted in all of us at St. Ben's and St. John's. When I ask students in the classroom to say, what makes us different than St. Thomas or Concordia or the University of Minnesota, if we push on it a little bit, usually this word community comes rising to the top as a central theme. And that's important because community is the place or the locus in which we learn wisdom. It is the place in which we learn to order and direct our knowledge for higher goods and service to others. Living in a dorm room teaches us how to order our priorities sometimes. Participating in a teach-in on MLK Day opens us to dimensions of community that we probably didn't anticipate prior to that. Walking in the Arboretum or seeing the Abbey Banner reminds us of the common good of transcendent beauty. 
St. Benedict famously writes in the prologue to his rule, quote, Therefore, we intend to establish a school for the Lord's service. As we progress in this way of life and in faith, we shall run on the paths of God's commandments, our hearts overflowing with the inexpressible delight of love, unquote. I'm confident that many of you have experienced moments of being part of a school for the service of others. And this is where we experience the ongoing conversion of moving from being a really good group of knowers to a community in pursuit of wisdom. If truth be told, the reason I loved my classes most at St. Olaf and the reason I couldn't turn away from those three majors was because I saw among them a kind of interconnectedness of human experience. Together, in so many of my courses, I began to understand how I might serve others, cultivate a common good, and, as St. Benedict sta- says, run on the path of life with a heart overflowing with love. I began to see wisdom shot through the many diverse dimensions of human knowledge so that, when well-trained, I could enact or live into community, creating places of transcendent goodness. That's a pretty, pretty high goal. Creating places of some kind of goodness with others. Now I have some bad news for you. I suspect that the pursuit of wisdom will be more challenging for you when you leave St. Ben's and St. John's. That's because many of you are not immediately entering another community like these places. Sometimes you may be going to places where you might feel alone or as one among a throng of individuals, where your individual gifts or knowledge is prized for its utility, where you are with people you don't have previous experiences of being part of wisdom groups. Sometimes the lack of such a community can even sow doubts about whether enacting wisdom, pursuing the common good, and building community are really central to your vocation and identity. How do we engage that problem? Well, most of you must do what good Benedictines have been doing for over a millennia and what Johnnies and Bennies have been doing for over a century. You must be builders of community. You must take what you know and what you some continue to learn and put it into the service of others. And not just the kind of service that is help for others, but service which instantiates you and others into a shared experience and a common community. Service that is committed to engaging others, listening to their experiences, and discerning how you might order all of these things into that which builds a common good and puts us in touch with inexpressible love. You must take the experience of wisdom that you've had here and think about ways in which you can produce that community in other places. This is not always easy, and worse, it's not always fun. Think of Dorothy Day, Thomas Merton, Martin Luther King, and Abraham Lincoln. At certain points, they were called to build communion among peoples in the face of pretty stiff resistance. To follow these wisdom figures, we must be willing to live into something beyond ourselves, something which builds up love and communion with others. The very last chapter of Benedict's rule is entitled, quote, This rule is only a beginning of perfection, unquote. Benedict goes on to write that following the rule makes us beginners in a process of lifelong learning, a lifetime of being homo sapiens. As you leave here and go out into the world, taking the gifts which we at Phi Beta Kappa recognize and celebrate in you, think of yourselves as lifelong learners, people who live into wisdom and build up community, indeed build up the kingdom of God in the world around you. That's no small task. But then again, you're capable of great things, of growing into the heights of wisdom. Thank you. Let's conclude this evening with observations from William Cronin, 
author of the essay, Only Connect. Liberal education is built on these values. It aspires to nurture the growth of human talent in the service of human freedom. Further education for human freedom is also education for human community. The two cannot exist without each other. We must be ever more aware of the connections we have with other people and the rest of creation and of the obligations we have to use our knowledge and power responsibly. In the end, it turns out that liberty is not about thinking or saying or doing whatever we want. It is about, the exercising, it is about exercising our freedom in such a way as to make a difference in the world and make a difference for more than just ourselves. Would all the members of Theta of Minnesota please rise? One last round of applause as we process out and reconvene in the Great Hall for a reception and banquet. Congratulations one more time.